the opportunity to talk today. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, report mainly on some uh, results from our long term cropping systems experiment uh, at the Arlington Agricultural Research Station, which is pictured here. Uh, part of this aerial uh, view, and we see the blooming dairy in the background. And so, as you can imagine, a lot of what's going on here in America's dairy land is uh, trying to grow crops to, uh, to feed these dairies. And so, a big part of what we've been doing with this crop systems research is looking at dairy rotation and that sort of thing, but also capturing uh, cropping systems as well. And within that context, I hope we can glean some uh, interesting information about. Uh, extending crop rotations, but I really want to try and push the envelope a little bit on what we're talking about when we talk about extending crop rotations. And uh, I might take just a, a few minutes here to sort of try and expand that envelope here in a, in a more or less academic way, and then hopefully we can bring it back to more boots on the ground and uh, uh, keep it real kind of discussion about uh, small grain and their role in crop rotations. I want to just make sure I acknowledge the UW Madison Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems, CIS, which has uh, played a huge role in supporting uh, a lot of the work that we do as well as the College of Agricultural and Sciences and the USDA uh, uh, has supported a lot of the work that we talk about today. And then uh, I just want to make sure that I point out two of my uh, colleagues, Anna Cates, Dr. Anna Cates, who's now a soil health specialist at the University of Minnesota and uh, recently finished up her uh, PhD with uh, working in my lab at UW Madison. And Dr. Greg Sanford, who finished his PhD with uh, a fellow named uh, Dr. Josh Posner, who started this long-term cropping systems trial uh, back in 1989. So we're still benefiting from that legacy. So I want to acknowledge that Greg has been part of this project, not since 89, but Somewhere along the way, going on, did his PhD with Dr. Posner and continued to work uh, with me and my students. So, those are two folks that we provided most of the data and most of the hard work. Uh, and, and talk about today. So, I, you know, Sarah emailed me and asked if I'd be interested in talking about extending the rotation, and I scratched my head and thought for a long time, like, what, is, what does she mean exactly, extending the rotation? So, as I said, I sort of <clears throat> took a typical academic approach to thinking about what, what this means. And in my mind, it means diversifying management from year to year and place to place. And we think a lot in my lab about uh, how we configure the landscape and how we put different crops in different places on the landscape and how that can affect uh, various ecosystem services, how that can improve water quality, soil carbon, and that sort of thing. But there's also this time component where Diversifying cropping system rotations uh, is, a, is a critical importance when we think about improving the system services. Uh, why might we want to do this? Why, as I mentioned, the ecosystem services part is critical, but largely we're talking about um, filling niche space or building and maintaining resources, trying to hold on to resources that are precious and trying to keep them from leaking out into the rest of the world where they can have some deleterious and undesirable effects. So part of why we think about uh, expanding and extending the rotation might be to try to pull on the resources. And how do we do this, generally speaking, by manipulating the types of crops that we plant, uh, the way we disturb those crops, soil disturbance, tilt, etc., nutrients we apply, that we apply or don't apply, uh, the way we manage pests and the way we harvest these crops. So again, this is a sort of an academic approach to be thinking. About what does it mean to extend crop rotation, and why, why might we want to do it? And so it's important to think about what the potential benefits of all that might be, uh, both to the farmer and to society at large. And so when we think about potential benefits to extending rotations, um, we certainly have to think first and foremost about income and what it means for the farmer in terms of profitability and, and bottom line income. People aren't going to do things that it's going to cost them too much money. Uh, if they're not going to get a return on investment and that sort of thing. So that's a paramount importance. And part of that equation is also building soil, holding on to carbon, uh, holding on to precious nutrients, as I mentioned, and, and suppressing pets. <laughs> suppressing pets. <laughs> Sorry. My, uh, my stepchildren had their goggles this week, so I'm just working with the Freudian stuff. 
And then there are potential benefits to society at large, like, you know, if we actually are improving farmer incomes and uh, opportunities for farmers to get in the game, and we're uh, uh, hopefully building markets and building thriving communities and that sort of thing, uh, as well as uh, uh, working on stabilizing climate and holding, uh, improving water quality, reducing flooding, and improving biodiversity. So these are all potential benefits of extending the crop rotation. But of course, there are potential costs, the cost of seed and soil harvesting when we change the way we do things, uh, is an important consideration. And the cost of society, generally speaking, are the cost of not doing things to extend the crop rotation or diversify crop rotation. And this is related to uh, rebuilding infrastructure as it's uh, flooded and uh, damaged from uh, that sort of thing. Compromised fisheries and recreation opportunities. And so it's really the tension here between these costs that is an important consideration for us as we move forward thinking about extending rotations and making changes uh, on the landscape. So um, I think I'm going to skip over this academic stuff here and get to uh, some of sort of what I might call my Bernie Sanders uh, part of the talk, where I start to wave my arms and talk about. Some of the problems with the current state of agriculture. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, posted this on his blog recently, and I was just astounded. I, mean, I just stared at it for a long time, uh, trying to get my head around why is this the case. Uh, but it shows farm profitability in the Northern Crescent, which is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, the upper parts of the Upper Midwest, um, over the last, I don't know, 15 or 16 years. 26, 27 years, and you can see that there were only four years during that long run where corn was actually profitable. And the reason I scratched my head and stared at this for a long time is I can't really reconcile how much corn is out on the landscape when I think about you know, the amount of corn on the landscape and this kind of data. Uh, I just don't understand it. So part of why I'm here today is to hear from you, help me understand why this might be. In the meantime, when we think about the sort of broader economic effects of uh, growing a lot of corn out on the landscape, um, there are things like this report, which talks about how much the exports matter. Because often what I hear is that uh, one of the reasons we grow so much corn is because of this export economy that's so important. Uh, I, I know that it is important because it does generate a lot of money. Uh, $19.1 billion and supports 56,000 jobs in 2016. Uh, for every one dollar in grain, grain product exports, an additional two dollars and twenty cents is supported elsewhere in the U.S. economy. So I get it that grain exports is a big part of why we support so much grain production. But reports like this, this report in particular, and I apologize if somebody here was part of producing this report, but this report says absolutely nothing about uh, the negative consequences of growing so much corn and the, the cost to society of growing so much. So, and this is the Bernie Sanders part of the show. Uh, a lot of this uh, uh, growing of grain uh, supports industries that uh, result in nutrient imbalances, and those nutrient imbalances uh, have ways of finding their way in the waterways. And this is a picture of the Heart River watershed, just uh, an hour south of here. The lakes around Madison are part of the Heart River watershed. And this is the uh, annual occurrence now. And actually, this year, for most of the summer, the lakes were in this state. And this color scheme doesn't do too well. I guess you can see over here, this is a bolt of that. But our lakes basically are just the kept white, the, the holding basins now for the runoff from agricultural uh, operation. And the use of these lakes has become severely impaired. Recently, uh, USDA has done some sampling of wells around southern Wisconsin, and virtually every well that they sample is contaminated with fecal uh, matter, and it's all being linked back to uh, livestock production. And of course, we can scale this up, and um, um, there's some very uh, undesirable effects of eutrophication in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of all this aggregation of nutrients that we moved in the stream. This is Black Earth, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, last uh, two summers ago, when we had massive flooding, uh, and you can see that there's an immense amount of infrastructure costs to the way that we manage our landscape. And uh, I don't have to 
Nonetheless, we continue to push on producing more and more and more yield, and we do it. We're very good at it. Uh, here's what this has in milk production in millions of pounds uh, over time. Here's milk production per cow. It's expanding, increasing at an, uh, an amazing rate. It's a real testament to dairy science. It's pretty impressive. Uh, nonetheless, the number of dairy farms in Wisconsin is exciting here in 2003. Is plummeting. It's, it's got half and on. I think that uh, in some counties there are less than 100 farms uh, now producing dairy. So we have a real crisis, and it's all uh, sort of underpinned by the fact that we are so productive, we're producing too much milk, and it's driving the prices down, and uh, resulting in lots and lots of social and economic problems. <coughs> not, not the least of which is consolidation. Uh, some of my colleagues say, well, this is just a natural outcome of supply and demand, the Walmartification, if you will, of uh, farming. And, um, you know, I think that it's uh, safe to say that most of us think that this is not a good direction for us to go from a social perspective. Most of us would like to see more family farms, more individual farms out on the landscape, out on the landscape, and less and less of this consolidation. Less and less abandonment of small communities like this. Even Governor Walker a couple of years ago uh, noticed that we have a crisis on our hands and that we have to do something about it, resulting in the Wisconsin Dairy Task Force that uh, has uh, been seeking solutions to the problem. So, okay, let me wrap up the Bernie Sanders part of this. Agriculture is in crisis, it's in a very uh, uh, shaky, uh, um, Place right now, I think a lot of folks feel like it's on a precipice and can go in a lot of different directions. Some of them not so good. It's in that against that backdrop that we've been conducting this integrated cropping systems trial with mm -hmm. Wix. Uh, as I mentioned, it was started by Josh Wilner back in 1989. Janet Hecke was a person who worked with him a lot on that project. But this experiment uh, was established in the 89 at two sites. One in Arlington, which is uh, not too far from here, and one down at a place called the Lakewood Complex in Elk Farm, Wisconsin. And um, these are uh, established three, as three large plots. They're uh, managed with field scale equipment, so these are not uh, little tiny agronomic plots. They're getting managed um, with hands, but mainly with commercial equipment. And uh, the whole of the experiment was set up to look at these metrics of productivity, profitability, and environment. So let me cut to the cropping systems that we look at here. And this is where the small grains that uh, becomes relevant. Uh, we have three different types of cropping systems that we uh, are comparing. Uh, they're grain types, they're forage types, and they're biomass types that were brought online about 10 years into the experiment. And of, of the grain types, well, we have all of these types are arrayed along sort of two main axes one of diversity and one of perenniality. So that as you move down here, you're getting more and more perenniality into the mix, and as you move from left to right, you're getting more and more diversity into the mix. And so the grain crops, we have a continuous corn system, we have a corn soybean system that's managed conventionally with um, uh, typical. Inputs of herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers. And then we have a corn soybean uh, rotation that has a wheat, uh, uh, winter wheat uh, cover crop, and then goes into a clover and oats crop that is grown throughout the rest of that season. Uh, and then um, uh, allow the winter kill and subsequently in the following season before we come back to farm. We have forage systems. Corn three years of alfalfa rotation. And then we have a rotation that's corn with an oats plant crop in the early spring, and then two years of alfalfa in the back of corn. And then finally, we have as a forage uh, system this cool season pasture, which is cool season grasslands, clover, and, and grasses uh, that are grazed by uh, heifers. And uh, you can see the picture here. So this is uh, these are the six main sort of uh, typical cropping systems that we have. And as I mentioned, we added these biomass cropping systems with switchgrass, a CRP mix of warm season grasses, 
and a, and a 25 species prairie. I'm not going to talk much about those today. I'm going to focus mainly on these uh, upper six uh, cropping systems. The two cropping systems that you see here in, in gold uh, are in gold because they are managed organically. They're not certified organic, but they are managed organically and always have been. And so there's some confound here in the types of crops that we have and uh, their management uh, with uh, you know, things like cover crops and organic. In other words, we can't separate it out in an orthogonal way all of the different parts uh, of these cropping systems. That's part of why we call our cropping systems trial. We try and manage each system the way we think that a farmer would manage that system, uh, as opposed to trying to come up with every combination of, of every different types. So those are managed organically, the others are managed conventionally. The pasture is more or less managed organically, occasionally we add uh, in canyon So um, we collect a lot of data here. I just want to acknowledge that Mike Walsh and Jimmy Susacek have done a lot of boots on the ground uh, data collection over the years. We keep that around the calendars and keep track of input prices and pay prices and uh, elevated prices and that sort of thing, so that we can calculate the economic uh, pluses and minuses of each of these cropping systems. And we do lots of uh, trying to capture the nutrients as they move around in, in, in these cropping systems and that sort of thing. So one of the big takeaway messages from early on from this project that was published in 2008 by, by Josh and his students uh, is that our conventional corn soybean rotation and our organic corn, soybean, wheat, clover, oats rotation uh, produce reasonably similar uh, amounts of grain in the, in the corn phases. Uh, you can see here that the organic was 96% and 94% of the uh, productive yield of the yield uh, of them. In, uh, in, in, in normal, Normal springs, and one of the rubs was that in, um, in wet springs where the May June precipitation was greater than 10 inches, uh, we saw a reduction in the organic acreage in the organic productivity largely because of weed management issues. So it was hard to get in through the uh, cultivation and the uh, cultural management that we do in the organic rotation. And so we took a hit on corn yields in the organic systems. But in those good years, I should say this is only four out of the 20 years that we're looking at. Um, uh, in those years uh, that, that we were able to do, do effective weed management, uh, the, the yields were very, very similar. And in spite of the fact that we had this you know, more complicated, convoluted, if you will, um, expanded rotations uh, with the corn soil. And we had similar results uh, when we looked at the soybean in those, in those same, in the same plots. We've been able to now look at the yields in these cropping systems over 26 years, and so each x-axis here is uh, looking over 26 years. Again, it was three conventional systems that are uh, shaded blue here, and then the two organic rotational, um, sorry, the two organic uh, systems that have cover crops, and then the pasture. And so the first thing that jumps out of here, of course, is that the overall yield in the pasture have been much less than the overall yield in the system. I should say that what we've done here is standardize yield across all six of the system and put it into the terms of uh, gigacalories per hectare uh, of energy uh, as produced by a you know, milking system. So all of the crops have been run through models that predict how much yield you would get from a milking system uh, with each of these crops. And so, again, what you see first is that the pasture system has uh, been as productive as the other systems. The second thing that I noticed is that these, uh, these systems that are shaded in blue have been increasing in overall yields through time. And uh, this is a result largely of genetic improvements that we've been realizing along the way. So we always plant the latest, uh, newest and latest variety of uh, corn and soybeans and alfalfa in these systems. Um, whereas these organically managed systems, 
We do plant organic varieties of corn, soybeans, wheat, etc. Uh, it just has to have the kind of breeding pressure that uh, these other uh, conventional systems have had. And so over time, we haven't seen the improvements that we see in those conventional systems. As well, there was a little bit of a uh, learning uh, uh, curve for us as we started managing these organic systems early on. But largely, the differences are because of the differences in genetics. So, um, if we distill all of this, we can look at um, the productivity, the stability, and the robustness of these yields over time. So productivity would be to just do what I just did uh, a minute ago, which is to look at the, the mean yield over time, and say some of them high and some of them low. But we're also very interested in how stable those yields are over time. And so here's a cartoon that Greg put together looking at how we calculate stability, and basically, it's the inverse of how variable uh, a system has been over time. And then finally, robustness or resistance is a measure of how a system does in the face of some uh, perturbation, like a drought or an excessive amount of water. And so, uh, and then we'll look at those in, in the, with the same data. Here's our same crops along uh, array along the x axis. And what you see here is, as I was mentioning before, the total output is the highest in the corn and corn soybean crops, least in the pastures, uh, but the amount of stability has been highest in the pastures, so it's the most reliable. If you're thinking about this, you can uh, know what to plan for in the pasture, even though there is less productivity. And um, the amount of stability doesn't really play out along the lines of the conventional organic or the uh, you know, inclusion of cover crops. I think it's just um, more or less running variability within, within those annual systems. And then we look at resilience, and you can see that the corn systems are the least resilient uh, to drought. So when we had this drought in 2012, the corn took the biggest hit. The other systems uh, all did pretty well. And then if we look at resilience in excessive rainfall years, the, ant, the perennial crops, alfalfa, where the both cover crops and pastures, the least resilient. So, uh, surprisingly to me, they didn't do so well in quite a lot. So, those are the yields. It's one thing to just talk about the productivity of the yields. But this um, work by John Paul Chavaz uh, that was published back in 2009 looked at the economic returns of these systems. Uh, and here I just sort of uh, arrayed the, the common system on the calendar for these various systems. And uh, what well, was very interesting is they looked at three different scenarios. And here's the first scenario. The first scenario was with no government payments, no insurance. This is just uh, elevator prices, if you will, for these various crop, for these various crops. Uh, and what was immediately uh, interesting is that the rotational grazing system was the significantly highest net economic return uh, investment. So it was the most profitable system of all these. And the other two perennial systems, whether they were conventional or organic, were the second most uh, profitable system. Um, we then added in uh, a government payment scenario where uh, in this situation you were receiving insurance or a payment for your lost productivity or your uh, under underperformance, if you will, with respect to yield. And that bolstered the no-till corn soybean uh, system significantly, but still a rotational grazing system, which received no government payment, uh, was the most profitable. And then finally, uh, John Paul Chavaz calculated this government payment plus an organic premium, uh, which at the time that he produced this, we were just starting to come on as a, uh, an, an opportunity for organic uh, production. And what you can see here is that that turns the organic grain, soybean, wheat, location into the most um, the most profitable system, although it wasn't significantly different from the grazing system, nor was it significantly different from the organic system. So having that organic cream in really boosts it that uh, significantly. Interestingly though, the rotational grazing system you know, never received an payment boost and never received an organic boost. And of course nowadays we know that if you're rotationally grazing and organic, you can receive even more of a boost to the profitability as you go that direction, so this one would have improved even higher uh, in today's uh, situation. So, uh, very interesting results. I think they've been sort of uh, not, not, not uh, widely recognized. 
Nonetheless, when I go to the literature and look for comparisons of uh, rotational grazing with other types of management, uh, I can see from a uh, uh, study in Maryland that even though the environment operators had higher gross income than the mid operator, that the rotational grazer, their expenses exceeded those of the mid operators and the profits were less variable. Uh, basically, the takeaway message is this, that grazing outperformed in quantum operations and were more profitable. Likewise, a study uh, out of um, North Carolina found the same thing, a study out of Michigan found the same thing, and our own Tom Kriegel here at the University of Wisconsin has a spreadsheet that uh, has yet to be published, but basically the distillation of the spreadsheet is the same thing that the grazing compared to the confinement was significantly more profitable uh, per cow, per, he per hectare basis, per milk produced basis. If we then look at environmental performance of these systems, we can see that the pasture system, uh, looking at Russell 2, which is uh, looking at soil erosion, had uh, very little uh, predicted soil loss. Our organic systems uh, were uh, predicted to lose uh, more soil than the others. And then when we looked at soil carbon, and by the way, I mean Greg, uh, Greg looked at soil carbon over a 20 year period. So he actually took um, archive samples and compared them to samples from 2010. And I'll talk more about this later in a breakout session. Uh, what he found is that all of the systems in our cropping system were uh, losing significant amounts of carbon during that 20 year period, irrespective of whether they were organic, irrespective of whether we had cover crops. The only one that was holding on to the carbon that it had in it to begin with was the pasture system. Oh, and now people are excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I want to come back to the crops a little bit, and cover crops in particular, this work that Anna Case uh, uh, did for her PhD uh, and, and was published in the Journal of Water and Soil Conservation, showed that. Uh, across five different sites, uh, from Crescent Lake, Minnesota, down to uh, Esther, Missouri, along this temperature gradient, uh, opportunities for getting cover crops in can be very narrow. The windows can be very narrow. So the windows are shaded here in green. This big block of shaded area in each uh, plot here is sort of the typical main crop harvest window. And so we're thinking about getting cover crops in after a main crop, uh, crop harvest. But then getting them in before, sorry, the x of the y-axis got cut off here, but the y-axis is uh, the minimum soil temperature for each of these cover crops to get planted. So you can see here that the minimum soil temperature for rye uh, is uh, just about 2 uh, degrees C. Let's see here. Uh, for oats, it's about uh, 7 degrees Fahrenheit, etc. That as the typical temperatures, which are the dots here on the plot, uh, as they decline, there's only a small period of time where each of these crops you know, have a window to get planted. And you can see that the window for planting uh, often, as we move farther north, is that there's a little no window for planting. And this is uh, one of the rubs that I'm sure lots of people either know about or have read about. Trying to get grains in the system is how do we get planted after growing main crops like corn and soybean. So that's been a lot of the issues that we wrestle with over time in the cropping system experiment. Uh, what I was able to show in this cartoon depiction is that as the amount of cover crop biomass increases, um, we get to a point where there could be a trade off between the main crop. And the cover crop itself. And so, what we're really hoping for is some amount of cover crop biomass that won't reduce the main crop biomass. But at the same time, we want a lot of cover crop biomass to enjoy some of these benefits of having the cover crops like erosion prevention and nitrogen retention. And so, this is just again trying to drive home sort of the small window that we have traditionally to try and get grains into our as cover crops into our rotation. And the thing away from this complicated plot is that when she did this and tried to expand the window by taking 
uh, corn on at, at silage earlier in the season to expand that window. The takeaway message is what it did was create a huge carbon source because the amount of corn that was supplying carbon into the system was completely undermined as we got the cover crop established. So the takeaway from this was that uh, you know the idea of cover crops to help build soil carbon and build carbon in the system sounds good, but it was very difficult to realize when we got a very productive crop of corn that otherwise we'll be contributing carbon in the system. And if you stop it right in the middle of its growth, it's inside of the shed to create a window for planting cover crops, you can really uh, undermine what you're trying to do with respect to soil carbon. That's not to say that there aren't lots of other good reasons to plant cover crops, holding on to soils, holding on to nutrients, etc. But if we're going to talk about trying to build carbon in the soil, uh, doing it with cover crops and bringing these cover crops can be very tricky. So, uh, this is my last uh, slide. Uh, I just wanted to say that what we're doing now with the new grant from USDA is uh, trying to throw everything but the kitchen sink at um, our cover crop systems at, at Wix. And so, what we're doing is taking our um, continuous corn, our corn soybean rotation, and then this existing cover crop rotation of corn soybeans of wheat and adding in even more cover crops along the way, reducing tillage as much as possible, adding manure, and then doing those things in combination. Again, trying to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. The reviewers of this proposal, one of them said, well, that all sounds great for academia, but <clears throat> no farmer's going to do all these things all at once. It's going to be too expensive, too unwieldy, etc." So one of the things we're trying to move forward here is talk to farmers, talk to uh, folks who might actually be managing these types of systems that find out, like, is it likely that they might do all these different things? They might go to the kitchen sink out of it, add it, and try to get uh, uh, soil health to improve. So let me end it there and just say my two main takeaway messages are extending rotations with cover crops can be tricky, as you probably all know. Uh, establishment and efficacy is highly variable. So getting them established is tricky enough. And then whether or not they're actually providing the benefits that we want them to provide uh, is a tricky thing to, uh, to understand. And I'm a grassland ecologist, so I have to leave you with perennial grassland. I seem to check all the sustainability boxes. Why don't we just do more of that? It seems like a more profitable system. Potentially holds on to carbon that we have, holds on to nutrients water quality, etc. And so um, I'll leave it with that for the rest of the session. Thank you.
extending rotations and moving more grains into the rotation. Maybe as uh, Sarah said earlier, we need as a gateway towards grass. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you have so many ruminants to feed here, I mean, you have larger, longer acres than we do in Iowa, because we mostly just have monogastric pigs to feed, which they don't really care about it. Um, but your longer acres do down as well, you know? So, well, if we can't do it here, then I mean, what's, what's the answer here? Okay, so what's your thoughts? How can we get it into the, into the room anymore? How can we get more grain? Small grain? Small grain? Grains? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the easy answer for me to stand up here and say is that we pay farmers to do it. You know, we pay them for the benefits of extending their rotation. We pay them for diversifying. Um, pay them for adding on nutrients and, and building soil. Don't have a simple, don't have a simple answer though. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. We are starting to go in that direction. But it still doesn't feel like a, a full-scale societal response. Um, I think that there are sort of piecemeal glimmers of hope where it's starting to happen. And so that's great. I'm thrilled that we're moving in that direction. Uh, I just think that it's going to take a, a bigger societal demand for it, if you will. You know, a societal demand that is translated into what we pay for food. Uh, what we pay for uh, clean water, what we pay for um, stable employment, and that sort of thing.